with my hair. <laughs> Is this a gift for us? Yes. Nope. Yes. It's for you. It's for, it's for you both. Yeah, okay. That works better. <laughs> you put that pillow. You're the one Yankee. Don't, Dan, be nice now. I'm not being nice. No, you're being I'm saving her phone. No. I'm saving her phone. No. I'm saving nice. her phone. Stop it. I told her mom the same time Stop. she's taking pictures. Stop. Yeah, I was going to put a finger prick the whole length of the camera. Yeah, we're, we've been videoing this oh. whole fun Wait. interaction. <laughs> what? What's that? For real? She was pregnant before they left. Is this an announcement? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you, and I found out you never say anything anyway. I'm so happy for you. Get that thing out of my <laughs> When we found out that we were expecting, um, we were pretty ecstatic and um, anxious to find out the gender, which came at about 20 weeks. So, in March. Yeah, in March we found out that it was going to be uh, a little girl, um, which one of us was really happy about. The um, other one took a little getting used to, but uh, <laughs> well, but it was okay. We um, just yeah, just thrilled that at the time we had a very healthy baby that we couldn't wait to meet. They came out to California for Christmas and Lisa made breakfast, for, I believe she made breakfast for us. And when we were at the table, she gave me a little gift that says something to the effect of all the great moms become grandmas. And um, I forget what the card said. Oh, she, they requested our presence in Pennsylvania between July 30th and August 10th or something. Took him a minute to figure that, figure out what it meant. Excuse me? <laughs> Man. The pregnancy was really easy. I did have gestational diabetes, which happens to a lot of women, but it was controlled. And so I ended up having to have two or three ultrasounds a week, some weeks after 32 weeks because they thought I had too much amniotic fluid, which again, isn't a big deal, but they have to monitor it. And so I have so many ultrasound pictures of her <laughs> because two or three times a week, I would go in and they'd, I'd get to see her face. It's great, put on 15, 20 pounds, it was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> pregnancy, yeah, I gained the uh, sympathy weight for pregnancy, about 15, 20 pounds, something like that. Yeah, I just, you know, we we uh, we ate a lot of hamburgers. It's just uh, beef, beef was hamburgers. a craving. So, um, so we went to Five Guys a few few times a week, and then realized <laughs> maybe we should just get burgers from Costco and uh, save a little bit of money. So yeah, we uh, <laughs> we made it work. You know, a lot of beef. Yeah, we were hoping we had been teasing a few few years before, and finally we just didn't say anything. And when they came out that Christmas, it was like. <laughs> yes! Awesome! <laughs> Baby girl Brackville decided to not come when she was supposed to. And so they said, well, if she doesn't come by the 29th, we're going to induce you. And so we tried everything that, like the internet says, about how to induce labor and nothing worked. So I was induced on the 29th and went into labor just a few hours later. But then it lasted for 20 hours. Baby girl's head was a little big. So finally they said we just need to get her out. So we did a C-section. She was born at 9.25 in the morning on July 30th. Brennan got to be the first one to hold her because I had to 
get sewn up and all that. <laughs> and so I didn't get to hold her for about an hour. I remember everybody remarking about how much hair she had. I did get to see her from the side because they they came in, you know, because when you have a C-section, you're laying flat. So they came and brought her over and I could kind of see her. And I was like, oh, she's got my hair. <laughs> yeah, a lot of hair. Yeah. Uh, we flew in the day Tori was born, so we got to see her within a couple of hours of her birth. Amazing. Most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It was the most amazing experience of my life to behold this little beautiful baby girl. We didn't even at that time know the name. They hadn't told us yet what her name was. It was a secret. Yeah. So, Victoria Ruth Brackbill. What a beautiful name. Tori. How cool is that? Our granddaughter. <laughs> Eety bitty thing. First thought that ran through my head was, holy crap, I'm a dad. <laughs> you know, wanted to always be a dad and now this little girl, someone we're completely responsible for. And I don't know, that first hour of just being able to hold her she was skin to skin, she was completely calm. She came out screaming as all babies do, but then when they were cleaning her up underneath the heat lamps, I just started talking to her and she immediately turned toward me and you know, quieted down, just like, oh hey, I know you. Hmm. You know, you're the guy I punched in the face when you put your face up to mommy's belly at about twenty four <laughs> weeks. I was like, Yeah, that's me, so but it was hmm. it was just really cool that she you know, calm down once um, once she heard my voice, and then uh, especially once I was holding her, she was she was pretty calm the entire time. So that was very neat. And people always say that it's it's just amazing how much you love your own children, and it's definitely true that you don't know it until you have your own children. Like you don't know what you're capable of, both in loving them, but also just in life in general. Because life with a baby is no walk in the park. They don't sleep. <laughs> They are very demanding, but you just do it. You do it because you love them and you wouldn't have it any other way. Hey. Honey. Hey. 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 Okay, let Daddy try something. Let Daddy try something. Okay. Ready? 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 And one. And two. And three. Going back five, six, seven. Wow. <laughs> She's either thinking, what the heck was that? Oh, girl. I'm very thankful my parents were here to help because babies, <laughs> babies are a lot of work. And she's never been a good sleeper. She definitely wasn't a good sleeper then. We have lots of pictures that I took at like two in the morning that I would post on Facebook that said, <laughs> what, sleep mom? <laughs> Why would I want to do that? Really? Is that so? Talk to mommy. Big yawn. <gasps> really? Oh yeah, life was great. We got the hang of things and we just loved her. Hi. You know, we loved every minute of being new parents and it's amazing how you don't mind changing diapers when it's your own kid. Like you don't mind doing all the things you have to do to take care of a baby when it's yours. It's, it's just an unbelievable feeling. Um, yeah, things were going well for like the first five months of Tori's life. I mean, she was she was meeting milestones. She was um, developing, growing, happy, smiling, really? playing with her toys. I mean, just you know, a typical everything that a baby would do. And then um, toward the um, toward the end of December into uh, January, she uh, it's like a switch went off. She just stopped smiling, um, playing with her toys and everything. And we just we thought maybe that she was um, trying to work on another milestone and regressing in some areas. Or we thought we weren't, we just weren't funny anymore. We joked about that. <laughs> I remember I realized at one point she hadn't smiled or laughed at me in about two weeks. 
And so I joked with Brennan one night that maybe we're just not funny anymore. And we really wish that were the case. We took her to the doctor because she became inconsolable. Like she would not stop crying. She would stop sleeping. Not that she ever was a good sleeper, but it was really bad. I took her to the pediatrician and we thought it was reflux. The symptoms are identical. They are fussy, they don't want to eat because she was kind of eating not the greatest. So the doctor was like, well, let's try some reflux meds. And they, he said it could take seven to 10 days to take effect. Well, then the next day she was not nursing well and she was even even more irritated and irritable than normal. I took, I called the pediatrician and he said to take her to the ER and to push for an MRI. And so we went to Hershey Med and they did a CAT scan. They came back in and the doctor had us sit down and, and she said that the CAT scan showed brain abnormalities. Those were two of the worst words that you could possibly hear as parents because that could mean a learning disability or it could mean death. I mean, that's a pretty broad range with brain abnormalities. So that Tuesday we had an appointment with the neurosurgeon and he looked at the CAT scan and when we told him the MRI date that had been scheduled, he said, we'll see about that. And he got on the phone and he got one for the next morning. That afternoon, the neurosurgeon called with the results and he, I don't remember exactly what he said because I remember that it was a lot of big words and at this time we were so stressed out that anything that was said was very difficult for us to process because we went from thinking we had a perfectly healthy baby to all of a sudden there's something really wrong with your baby and that is traumatic, honestly. My mom and I went to the neurologist appointment to review the MRI with the neurologist and Brennan didn't go because we didn't think that it was going to be a life-changing appointment. We just thought it was going to be, I don't know what we thought it was going to be, but not this big crucial thing. That's when they first gave us the word leukodystrophy. And I remember Dr. Byler saying that she had a feeling that she knew what it was, but she asked if I wanted to know or if I wanted to wait for the actual blood testing to come back, and I said I wanted to wait. But that same day, Tori wasn't eating well, and I didn't know if it was because I was really stressed out. So we called the pediatrician, and he said that it might be time for a feeding tube, at least temporarily, because she wasn't gaining weight. At that point, they also labeled her as failure to thrive. So they admitted us to the hospital, and we thought we were going to just be in, get the feeding tube through her nose, and leave. But that is not what happened. We ended up being there for five days total and they didn't tell us that there was an end in sight. It just was just this ongoing thing. And I stayed in the hospital with Tori. Brennan stayed over the weekend, but then because he was working, he went ahead and went home to sleep. And so I was like trapped in the hospital. And every single day we got worse and worse news about her. Different people would come in to do different tests or we would take her somewhere in the hospital to do different tests. Like they, had, they did a swallow study to make sure that she wasn't aspirating anything into her lungs. And it turns out that she was. So that meant that the NG tube was there to stay. And I remember that day very distinctly because the speech language pathologist very firmly told me to make sure that she takes a pacifier. And what we found out that day is that the sucking and swallowing reflexes are use it or lose it. If she were to keep using a pacifier, that would help her continue to be able to swallow. And we were finally discharged on Wednesday after finding out that our baby wasn't swallowing properly. She might have low vision. She had a feeding tube, which was a whole new learning curve for us, learning to use the pump and the feeding bags and having all this equipment in our house, everything. And February 13th was when we got the worst news of our lives. So after the um, hospital stay, we, uh, we came home just kind of waiting for news on the um, blood they took from Tori to uh, have it sent to a special lab to um, have it tested for certain leukodystrophies. And um, I got a text from Lisa, I was actually at work, and um, saying that we had uh, an unscheduled appointment with um, Dr. Byler, I believe, who was not working that day, um, but wanted to see us. So we knew that this news was either going to be really good 
are really bad. So we showed up um, at Dr. Byler's office and uh, we're waiting for her. She come in and in street clothes and there was just something in the air that, that told us that something very bad was about to happen and it, it, um, news turned out to be the just the worst day of our lives um, she told us that it was uh, it was indeed crab a um, probably the worst leukodystrophy that that we probably um, could have been told um, uh, we had no idea what it entailed but we just asked question after question you know how long do we have with her um, what's going to happen to her and you know it's just one of those situations that I felt uh, <laughs> I'm sorry I felt like I was just sucker punched in the gut so hard that you know I couldn't get my breath I mean we tried for so long to have Tori and and here you know we, we find out that we may only have you know uh, till her second birthday with her, um, you know, just, just all this news that you know, we just didn't want to accept. You know, we we grieved really hard that day. We told um, we told immediate family right away, um, and then we uh, we told some of our closest friends, and then you know we we made it public to the world. That was a difficult phone call because my wife couldn't talk on the phone. She was in tears. So I asked her, get me a plane ticket and I'll be on my way. That is the most heartbreaking thing to ever hear. You love your life, can't talk to you on the phone because of the news that Tori was sick. I'm always an optimist, so. The first time Lisa and I took Tori to the neurologist, she said there was some leukodystrophies that are treatable. So of course I said, well, she'll be fine. The strange thing is that you never heard of it. You never heard of it, never knew about it, didn't know it existed in our family. And then to hear that, it's just stunning. My first thought was, okay, Crabbe couldn't even say leukodystrophies, is, well, how do you treat it? And when they said there is no treatment, that just takes your breath away. It's still stunning. I mean, it's extremely <clears throat> tough as a dad to a beautiful baby girl of our own, Lisa, is that I couldn't help her, I couldn't fix it. I couldn't fix it. So it just breaks your heart. With every bit of bad news that day, there there was a silver lining that um that was uh, pretty awesome how it turned out. We um we were accepted, I guess is a weird way to put it, into the uh, the Crabbe family at that point. Um, we had some people from the Crabbe family. Tell us, you know, we need to get a hold of Dr. Escalar from uh, from Pittsburgh, who is one of the leading experts um, in the field of leukodystrophies. And you know, it was like you know 9:30 at night, and um, one of our uh, one of our new friends and family members, um, uh, Tammy, actually gave uh, Dr. Escalar our information and, and number. And at like 10, 10.30 that night, we actually got a phone call uh, from Dr. Escalar mm -hmm. you know, on a Friday night of all nights and just just yes. completely blew us away. Um, you know, here's someone that, you know, cares about our situation. And um, as we uh, actually, Lisa talked to her for, uh, for a little bit and if we could have got it worked out that uh, she wanted to see us the following week. When we realized we were going to need to go to Pittsburgh and Brennan realized it was going to be very difficult to get the time off, my parents said, we'll go. While we were there, Tori went through a bunch of testing, including another MRI, and 
Uh, we met with Dr. Escalar a couple of times and she sat down with us at the end of our three days there and she told us that Tori did indeed have early infantile onset Crebe, which is the most severe, and life expectancy is two years of age or less. Crebe disease is a disease that is caused by a mutation in, in a gene. Um, when you have these mutations, you're unable to make a protein and uh, it's a slow process, but because babies usually with this disease are so healthy otherwise, you know, their heart is healthy, their lungs are healthy, all their organs are healthy, and it's just really a neurologic disease, it can take years for it to, you know, to take them to a point where their heart will, will stop and, and they will die. So going through this neurodegeneration is, is um, you know, it's, it's hard and babies don't understand what's happening to them. They are just feeling all kinds of symptoms and pain and they can't eat and they feel like they're going to choke and they're refluxing and vomiting. And it's just an ongoing one thing after the next that makes the baby feel incredibly uncomfortable. And therefore, you know, one of the first symptoms with this disease is babies just cry 20 hours a day all the time and you can't calm them down and it's obviously very distressing for the parents. Usually the disease presents with uh, difficulty feeding and reflux. These are very common symptoms in babies who don't have diseases like this. So in general, pediatricians usually start changing the formula and saying, you know, it's maybe colics, you know, maybe the baby has a little bit of reflux, but he will outgrow it. And then they get reflux medicines, but things don't get better. They just get worse and worse and worse and worse. And then when the baby's crying 23 hours a day, uh, that's when usually the parents are like, okay, there is a bigger problem than this. We need to get more help. And at that point, usually the pediatrician then refers them to a neurologist. They do an MRI and that's usually where they see that there is a problem. And then they start investigating what is causing the demyelination of the brain. By the time that they get a confirmed diagnosis, there is too much damage to the brain to really help them, even if we had a perfect treatment. So that's kind of the story of, of this disease, unfortunately. This whole uh, journey with um, Tori being ill has just uh, had a great impact you know, in many ways. But a lot of times I'll start thinking about things and, you know, the emotional toll that that takes, you know, just wears me down physically some days where, you know, I get through my day, but then I come home and I'm exhausted. You know, I want to spend time with Tori and Lisa, and I do. It's just, you know, we're both so tired just because she requires so much work. It's a fierce love. I know, yeah. Our days begin at 5.30 a.m. with one of her medicines that has to be given an hour before she eats. So we always have it ready in a syringe the night before so we don't have to stumble around trying to get it ready. It's just right there, ready. 5.30, we give it to her. So, and I usually get up about 6.30 to get ready for work. But before I do, I get Tori's first feed ready at 6.30 um, and just let her eat while I get ready for work and keep an eye out for and an ear out for, especially if she needs to be suctioned or taken care of, just so that if Lisa is able to fall back asleep, she's uh, not disturbed too much. And then around eight o'clock, Tori's uh, second med of the day is uh, given by me, and you know, if she needs anything else, like a diaper change or whatever, that I uh, try to help uh, with that as much as possible before I leave about 8.15 on a normal work day, and Head out the door. At nine o'clock she gets her second med of the day and I have I have alarms on my phone for all of these things because otherwise I would forget. So she eats again at 10 30, 2 30, 6 30, and 10 30. We have her feeds set four hours apart. Throughout the day she has it depends on the day but she has various therapies that early intervention comes to do whether that's vision, physical, soon occupational, she has a nutritionist that comes to weigh her every other week. She has a visiting nurse that comes every week. So there's always something that's going on during the day, but thankfully they all come to our house so that I don't have to get Tori ready to go anywhere. They just come to us. And so between the meds, the feeds, the therapies, her somewhat regular afternoon nap, our, our days are just 
completely busy. We try to keep the evenings to be pretty free so that we can have family time and just enjoy being home together as a family. Her last feed's at 10.30 at night, as I had said, and it doesn't end until 11.30, so our days usually don't end until midnight. From the very beginning, we have seen such incredible support from not only our family and friends, but from complete strangers. And we have just been astounded by, by the love that people have expressed to us through this because it has truly been the worst experience of our lives. But even in that, we're seeing the kindness of people like we've never experienced before. So it's such a contrast between this terrible situation, but also it's bringing out the best in people. When we were picking out her nursery theme, the least obnoxious thing that we saw in the store was the giraffe. And we didn't hate giraffes, so we thought, okay, we'll go with it. When she got sick, we found this giraffe that lit up and played music and she loved it. And so we started just having it with her all the time, which meant that it was always in pictures with her. So the people following her on Facebook saw it in all the pictures and began to associate giraffe with Tori. And therefore we were sent I don't even know how many giraffe related items because now anytime anybody sees a giraffe anywhere, it reminds them of Tori. And so if it is something that is tangible, they often send it to us and so we love it. When we were at the Hunter's Hope Family Symposium in July, we were speaking with several other families who mentioned that they had bucket lists for their babies. We created a list and some of the things were pretty advantageous, but we thought, well, let's just put it on there and see what happens and we have been blown away by the generosity of people. We put it on the blog simply because it was part of her continuing story and we've been chronicling the whole thing on the blog. But once we posted it, it we just got such an amazing response from people offering to pay for things, offering tickets, offering their connections to do things. And the biggest thing that we were able to do was we were able to take her to Disney World, which every kid should be able to go to Disney World. That was one of our themes. We found a foundation called the Quinn Madeline Foundation. They grant wishes for infants in honor of their daughter who also passed away from a leukodystrophy before she turned three. And so they work with parents to create experiences that they know that their kids would love. So we applied and they were more than willing to help us go to Disney World and they gave us an amazing experience. Aside from Disney, we've done so many other awesome things. Um, one of my favorites was uh, a friend of ours got a hold of the Philadelphia Phillies and we were able to go down to a game and just you know experience a game. Tori loves being outside. You know being a sports fan it was a uh, you know it pulled on my heartstrings because I love sports so much and Tori was just able to experience something new. We did the uh, Baltimore Aquarium she got to experience all sorts of different colorful fish. Uh, we've also um, taken her to New York City and experienced uh, the Statue of Liberty on Ellis Island and such. Got to teach her history young. Yes, got to teach them, got to teach them history <laughs> from the get-go. <laughs> Yeah, we took a long break because of travel and, you know, a lot of germs and such that would, um, that are just floating around basically because it's cold and flu season and things like that. So we didn't even go to church for a few months uh, because any infection could ultimately, you know, kill her because of a weakened immune system. So we kind of took a little break from the bucket list until our New England road trip in which we uh, had an Easter egg hunt and it also happened to rain that same day so we kind of played in the mud puddles which every kid should do. <laughs> so we took care of two big items that 
every kid, every kid should have uh, the enjoyment of doing. All in all, we completed 50 bucket list items with her, so we're pretty proud of that. So we returned from our New England road trip, and we were home just kind of chilling, and Tori had been struggling for several weeks with what we call these blue episodes, where her oxygen saturation would dip, but she would always quickly recover. The Saturday we got home, uh, Tori's alarms went off, her oxygen started dropping, and it just dropped and dropped and dropped, and we had no idea what to do. We were using uh, pieces of her equipment to try to clear her throat, Nothing was working and her oxygen saturation actually dropped to 4%. We, um, as many times as before, thought, is this it? We were, we were in tears, we just had no idea what was going on, but she recovered and she was fine, you know, for the longest time then, you know, the rest of the night. And I took the night shift that night so Lisa could get some sleep, as we normally did. And about five in the morning, her alarms go off and her oxygen's dropping and dropping and dropping and then all of a sudden she just stopped breathing and her pulse oximeter which tells us her numbers just you know flatlined and so I'm trying to suction her I'm trying to clear her throat I'm just trying to tap her lightly tap her back everything that we've been taught to try to you know loosen what might be jamming up her throat. I grabbed my stethoscope at the same time. I'm trying to call Lisa on the cell phone. I'm just, I, truth be told, I, I, I kind of panicked. Sunday morning we heard a um, crying from up above. We stay in the basement, um, which is below Lisa and Brennan's room. And we knew something was up. So mom and I ran up and um, Tori had passed. Um, she was lifeless. Her color was blue. Uh, Lisa and Brendan were deeply upset um, because they thought that and we thought we had more time to share with Tori. I was, I laid her down. Lisa was trying to, you know, just some sort of life. We're just trying to get some sort of life out of Tori. And I had my stethoscope out. You know, I have a bit of a medical background. I know all the focal points to listen for heart, heart rate, excuse me and respiration and there was just nothing i mean she she was gone she just was absolutely gone no heartbeat no pulse no respiration so lisa and i are trying to collect ourselves realizing that she had ultimately had respiratory failure you know the nerves just stopped working so they had phone calls they had to make they had to call hospice and other notify other folks to, um, that Tori had passed. So Lisa handed me Tori and I had my pajama bottoms on. So Tori and I were skin to skin and all of a sudden she took a breath. But after that first gasp, she did it again. And then she started breathing normally. Her color came back to her lips. So I grabbed my stethoscope and I put it to her chest and there was a strong heartbeat. So we turned the pulse oximeter back on her numbers were as good as they've been in weeks. Yeah. Before all this, we called the hospice nurse. The hospice nurse said, I'll be there as soon as possible. She showed up. She checked Tori out. We told her what happened because we didn't know if we thought we were crazy or other people would think we were crazy. And she said, you're not crazy at all. She said, you did everything you could. You, you know, it's not hard to use a stethoscope. She had a heartbeat, she didn't, then she had one again, so she literally came back to life. So after the hospice nurse spent um, about a half hour with us, she left because Tori was, you know, ultimately okay at that point. So Lisa and I both laid down with her and she had fallen back asleep and we were just cuddling with her and just trying to get some sleep ourselves. And then at about nine o'clock, her alarms went off again and her oxygen dipped very quickly and she ultimately breathed her last at 9.05. Well, you always think you have more time. So much of our time we're doing none, silly stuff, nothing important. You know, it's just cherish every moment you have. 
those last few hours, you know, I know we'll never forget because we had the chance just to spend some good quality time with us. She went very peacefully. She ultimately went in her sleep. Mm -hmm. It's just that her, her little body was ready. And I very specifically remember Lisa saying when her numbers continued to drop, saying, if you want to fight, we'll fight with you. But if you want to go home to Jesus, just go, just go. Because ultimately when she did that, she was suffering no more. She was doing everything she could that she couldn't in heaven now. And it's just, there was, there was a peace inside of an immediate peace because she wasn't suffering some more. Ultimately being selfish, we wanted her to stay. We wanted to keep her. We were her parents. But just knowing that she wasn't suffering anymore was just, it was good. It was good. It was the weirdest day of my life. That's, I mean, I kept saying that on Sunday. I was like, this is, it was just, weird and it wasn't like a denial weird because we had been preparing for this for 14 months but i don't i don't know that you're ever ready it was it was kind of weird knowing that we wouldn't be able to hold her anymore and and um things like that but i don't know i still felt a peace because i knew that her spiritual body was restored it was free yeah. It was at peace. We have received so much love and uh, support through this entire journey, but especially on the day that Tori went home. Especially because most people were just as shocked as we were. Yeah. That's what we heard over and over, or read over and over again was people were like, but she was doing so well. And all we could say was, I know. Like we know she was she was doing great and we were planning her second birthday party and so that was that was probably the number one response that we read on her Facebook page was just like what? Just complete shock because we all, including Dr. Escalar, thought that she had at least six more months. And I never expected it to be like this, but we had watched her decline for fourteen months. And we watched her get to the point where she couldn't even sneeze. We realized about a, a month before she passed away that we couldn't, we couldn't figure out when we had last heard her even sneeze. She couldn't yawn. She couldn't do all of these things that normal human beings should be able to do. And already we've seen just, I bet, a small bit of the impact that she has had. Our journey is far from over. Her story isn't done. We have work to do to make sure that this disease is as close to eradicated as we can get. Our fight's not over. We are fighting for the future of children that may have just been born or have yet to be born. One of the things that we have been working on in her name is to have legislation passed to reform newborn screening in Pennsylvania. We're starting right here at home because even though legislation was passed in 2014 that is supposed to make screening for crab A at birth mandatory, the state is not implementing it. They are not honoring that law that was passed. And so this has become my job because when she passed away, I asked Brennan, I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do now? Do I go get a job? Like, what do you do when you're a stay-at-home mom without a child? And he said, you have lobbying to do. <laughs> and so we're hoping that we can make a difference in the lives of all the babies in Pennsylvania. Because one of the things that we discovered is that in Pennsylvania, newborn screening is not done equally from hospital to hospital. So in essence, your zip code could determine your life or death. Mm -hmm. And that is not acceptable. And so we decided that this is going to be our fight. And to quote the band U2, as I have to the legislators I've spoken with already, where you live should not decide whether you live or whether you die. And 
we want to make sure that every child in Pennsylvania is screened for the exact same things no matter if they are born in a town of 10 people or a big city like Philadelphia. So that's one of the things that we are working on. But we are also working on getting Pennsylvania to actually implement the law that is was signed into law. It is supposed to be mandatory that every single baby is screened at birth for crab A and a few other leukodystrophies and the Department of Health decided to not honor it. So I'm going to be very busy starting right here at home and then we will not stop until the other 47 states that are not screening screen because no one should have to go through what we and what Tori especially went through. It's not it's just unacceptable. Like no one should have to lose their child to something that could have been treated. The most important thing that we can all do to advance the legislation for crab A screening is to write to our legislators, to call them, to visit them, because they are supposed to represent their constituents and the causes that are most important to those constituents. And saving the lives of children should be of utmost priority. So you can even go to huntershope.org and they have a template that is already written. And when you fill out your address and your name, it will automatically send it to your specific representatives, including your state's governor. The letter is able to be customized so that you can add in what impact these babies with Crebe may have had on your life and why it's important to you personally that this legislation be created and then signed into law. It is something that is very important for each and every one of us to do and to work together to make sure that this happens. We would urge everyone to join us in this fight against Crab A, against other leukodystrophies like MLD and ALD and all the LDs that um, would be involved. Uh, all these diseases are horrible and something that we have said many times is that no child should ever have to go through this and no parent should ever have to watch their child go through this. We just want to make sure that we can do everything possible to eradicate all these leukodystrophies. We are just so thankful that we were chosen to be Tori's parents and that we were able to fight with her and for her and that we learned so much about ourselves and about life in general and about how none of us are promised tomorrow. We are so thankful that we have truly learned that joy is a choice and that we had the opportunity to learn that with Tori and practice that and teach her that. And that is something that we are going to continue if we are blessed to have more children. Life is far too short to have conflict and drama and all these things. And so we do choose joy every day and we encourage others to do the same. And we really encourage parents to not take their children for granted because there are people like us who would do anything to have a disobedient toddler right now, getting into everything, wreaking havoc. We would do just about anything. So don't take anything for granted.